Hello everyone, thanks for watching and welcome back to the uh, series Biblical Insights. Very glad to have Dr. Michael Heiser here with us. If you're not familiar with his work, I certainly recommend you become so. I'll put some links to his uh, podcast, books, website, etc. so you can get familiar with his work. We could definitely give him a lengthy introduction, but for the sake of time and to get right to our topic, let's, let's just say that Dr. Heiser is very well qualified to take us through this discussion on how to study the Bible better. So, Mike, let me just start by saying I know your schedule is extremely hectic, so thanks so much for taking time out of it to be with us. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't help when your car dies and you get an unexpected six inches of snow, and there's no snow removal, so let's just say it's, we're working on a disaster here. Did, did the snow come before your car gave up or after? The car died before the snow. It's just I was supposed to meet somebody to get towed off somebody's lot today, and then we got snow last night, so it's... It's just been chaotic. And, and you still made it here for uh, for this discussion, so really appreciate uh, that. <laughs> hour late. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Mike, let's just start with a question that's very simple. It may seem simplistic, but I don't think it is. Uh, how do you read the Bible, and what are some things that are going through the back of your mind as you do read the biblical text? Yeah, well, it it, it is a fairly complicated question, but I'll, I'll try to... I'll try to say something useful here. Um, it's difficult for me now to read anything in Scripture without having a hundred elements of the ancient Near Eastern Israelite worldview running through my head. And uh, you know, the same goes for the Second Temple Jewish intertestamental you know, Jewish worldview running through my head. I, I've just had my head in that for so long that, uh, you know, it's, it's unavoidable. It's, you know, I don't want your listeners to get to already feel overwhelmed by, by that answer. Because when I came to the Lord as a teenager, I, this is no exaggeration. I mean, I had no sort of foundation at all in, in anything Christian. Um, I knew I had heard of Noah, I had heard of Adam and Eve, and I had heard of Jesus, and that was it. So I, I tell people, look, you know, it, it may feel overwhelming uh, to listen to me when I talk about the right context for interpreting the Bible is the context that produced the Bible. You know, God prompted people living in a specific time, place, worldview, culture, and they wrote to an audience from the same place, the same intellectual you know, context. And if you want to know what Scripture says, you must read it, you know, unfiltered by modern contexts. You have to have the Israelite living in your head and the first century Jew living in your head. But, but I can do that now, but only because... I'm, I'm the cumulative result of a little time every day for years. And, and I, I, I'm not trying to kid anybody. If I can do it, you can do it. Because most of you who are listening to this are, are already ahead of where I was when I got started. And, you know, be encouraged. You know, let, let not your heart be troubled. If you just devote a little bit of time, five or ten minutes a day, to learning something new about scripture and specifically about the, the scriptural context. At the end of a year, you're going to know a lot. At the end of two years, you're going to double that, you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, you, you actually can do this, but uh, it, it just sounds overwhelming, you know, for me to answer that question like, like I did, because it's, it's the honest answer. There are so many things floating around in my head because of experience that it's just, um, you, you can't sort of start people there, but you can tell them what the goal is. And with, with respect to not overwhelming people, though, would you agree, it doesn't take very long to go from the ancient Near East, for example, being very strange and very weird yeah. to being suddenly very interesting. It, it really doesn't take oh, much exposure oh, to that material to get into that's, it. That's, I would agree with you. That, that happens in a flash, and I'll, and I'll add something else to this. Back in the day, you know, I've been a believer now for, you know, almost 40 years. So back in the day, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have computers. 
we didn't have anything that speeded up the process. It was all, you know, hardcover books. And, you know, part of the part of the difficulty is knowing what's useful and what isn't. You know, what what to get. And then of course, you know, being able to obtain it, you know, being near a library or having you know, being able to buy this or that, you know, title. We live in a day and age that you can get there so much faster than you know I did, than you know anybody in my generation, just because of the digitization of materials. The problem is not, you know, is there enough out there, you know, to, to help me do this. The problem is there's so much, and and what you need is is you need somebody to help you winnow it. And, and direct your attention to something specific because it is obtainable. And once you see it, you know, once you start seeing these things and start thinking like an Israelite or thinking like a first century Jew, all this weird stuff in the Bible has its own logic. Um, once you start seeing it, you won't be able to unsee it. And it, and it will unlock scripture to you uh, as, as never before. Yeah, and we're certainly going to uh, ask you to guide us through what some good resources are, because like you said, there are so many of them, and you know, what, you're not going to rely on Amazon reviews, and you're yeah. not just going to walk into a bookstore. <laughs> so we'll definitely get into um, some, some good recommendations that you would have for us. Before um, we get into that, though, could you give us maybe just a, a quick example of reading uh, a passage, for example, through tradition, and then reading it uh, with the ancient Near Eastern background or Second Temple background, just to give uh, listeners a, an idea of what the payoff is. Yeah, boy, what's a what's a quick what's a quick path here? <laughs> well, I, I think well, I, to to me, it, it, I'll pick Deuteronomy thirty-two I mean, yeah. because this is just so foundational to not only the the Old Testament, Old Testament theology, and really the Old Testament story, but also the New Testament. You know, I wasn't a, I was a doctoral student before I had ever come across Deuteronomy 32, 8, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, it, fortunately, we have three or four modern English translations that have incorporated the Dead Sea Scrolls into that passage. It says something to the effect of when, when the Most High divided up the nations. He divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, but Israel, verse nine, is Yahweh's inheritance. You know, Jacob is his, you know, a lot of possessions. So we know when when the nations were divided, when their their borders and their boundaries were fixed. You know, that's that's the Tower of Babel incident. That, that's easy. We, you know, everybody knows that. Who goes to Sunday school? A few, you know, a few weeks, you're gonna run into that. But. But he, God divides them up according to the number of the sons of God. Like, what in the world is that? You know, and it's, it's a reference to God divorcing himself from humanity in judgment and assigning the nations to lesser members of his own heavenly host, who, unfortunately, uh, as time goes on, become deeply corrupt and hostile. They become his rivals. And this is the Old Testament explanation for why, where the nations get their gods, you know, where they get the, where these pantheons develop, because everything up to Babel, I mean, everybody's relating to the same God, you know, the true God. And, and this is a this is a common ancient Near Eastern notion. It's a common Greco-Roman no, notion that the nations worship the gods they have because they are assigned to those gods, and those gods assigned to the nations. Um, this is a biblical version. Of that, so that that frames the rest of the Old Testament. It's why the rest of the the Bible really is Israel against the nations and Yahweh against the gods. It's where the prince of princes of Daniel ten, prince of Persia, prince of Greece, these supernatural beings. This is where the idea comes from. Daniel ten has a history. It comes from somewhere. It's not just out of the blue. It goes back to Babylon. This is where Paul gets his principalities and powers. Paul does occasionally use the term demons. Uh, but most of the time, it's principalities, powers, rulers, authorities, thrones, dominions. What all those words have something in common? They are terms of geographical dominion, and that makes sense because if you have these rival, supernatural rivals over the nations surrounding Israel, well, that, that's what you got. You know, the Gentile nations are under the dominion, the domination of hostile supernatural beings uh, who enslave their populations. And Psalm 82, God judges them because. 
corrupt. And they enslave their agents. He tells them in verse 6, you're going to die like them. You know, I said to all of you, Psalm 82, verse 6, you are gods, you're Elohim, all of you, sons, plural, of the Most High. But you're going to die like men because of what you're doing, verse, the preceding verses. You know, all of that is a very common ancient Near Eastern worldview, but you're not going to find that in any doctrinal statement. You're not going to find that in any church, creed, or tradition. I mean, you, you literally are going to miss, if, if you don't get that passage correct, a lot of a lot of English translations will will say that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. That's like what the King James says. Again, the Dead Sea Scrolls has sons of God. Well, you don't you don't need to be a textual critic to figure out that the sons of Israel makes no sense. That the text you know was changed at some point, and it's because Israel didn't exist when the nations were divided. There was no Israel. If you look at the table of nations in Genesis ten, there Israel's not in the list. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But unless you discover these things, and again, I was a doctoral student the first time I ran into it, which is crazy. Um, but it just it reorients and reframes your Old Testament and your New Testament in really significant ways. You understand now what, you know, Paul alludes to this passage in Acts 17. Oh, it has something to do with, with the nations coming to Jesus. Yeah, it does, because when God disinherited the nations in Genesis at uh, Babylon, he, he makes a covenant, right, after he does that with Abraham and says it's going to be through your seed that all these nations will be blessed. They'll all, be, they'll all come back into the family at some point. But right now, I'm divorcing them and I'm assigning them to lesser beings. And we'll see how that goes. They didn't want me to be their God at Babel. Again, we had the fall, we had the flood, now we've got Babel and you still aren't listening to me. Well, let's see how that works. I, yeah. I've, I've had enough and you've mentioned several texts from both the Old and the New Testament, and you talk a lot about watching for the writers. You know, are they doing something to you? Has this motif occurred before? Will it occur again? I mean, you've mentioned something that literally goes from the first book of the Bible through Revelation. And that's really yeah. important when we keep in mind that, you know, the, the biblical writers weren't snapped into a trance. They're actually carefully crafting their material. Of course, Mark is a really good example that's been realized yeah. in recent scholarship, but it's really important to read and look for that kind of thing. But like you're saying, other, without this background knowledge, otherwise we read right through Deuteron Deuteronomy 32 and miss it, and then miss a lot of other stuff as well. But, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, one of the best things that people can do is, is one of the simplest. But I'll give two examples. You know, in your Bible, either at the bottom or in between the columns on a page, they have cross-references. That isn't just because the publisher needed some filler. Oh, my typesetter left a bunch of white space here. What do I do with it? No, it, it, it's so that you go back and look for connections. And, and with it, the, in modern Bibles, the typesetting for like Old Testament quotations will be a little bit different. It might be in a different font, it might be in cursive or italics or something like that. And it, it, it's, it's very useful to use the cross references and go back and look, you know, when, when an Old Testament passage is being quoted. Because that helps you connect dots. It's a simple thing, but if you do it over and over and over again, it's, it's going to produce results. Yeah, absolutely. We um, Talking about reading the Bible, let me run this past you. I think that, at least I think my reading has changed or been influenced, or I have to resist the influence of social media, because we get in the habit of reading very, very quickly. And it's yeah. a hard habit to break. And so as we move into the topic of translations, that typically this question gets asked, um, you know, what's the translation that's closest to the original text? These are some, some pre-submitted questions from the listeners. Um, you know, what do you think is the most accurate Bible translation? And I really think that when you look at modern translations, some of them could contribute to a very fast reading because they're so... They're so smooth, like the the newest NIV, the 2011 NIV. What's what's your take on that? I mean, how does how has modern you know technology affected our reading, and and what translations yeah. do you kind of gravitate to? It really has. It's not pie in the sky. If you and your and your listeners want your souls crushed a little bit more, I would recommend reading the book called The Shallows. The subtitle is What the Internet Is Doing to Our Brain. Yeah, and and it. it our brains are being literally rewired by the medium, and it's 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 disturbing. It's troubling. You can see it in yourself when you when you read you know, again the explanations of why this is so. 
And so you're, you're correct. You have to do intentional things to slow yourself down. And I, I think one of the, the easiest ways to do this is not go with one translation, but to actually read uh, from several and compare. Um, you know, ultimately, the, the most effective Bible is going to be the one you read, I mean, as opposed to not reading it. But I prefer, um, I prefer translations that tend to be on the, on, you know, we'll use the word literal, formal equivalence, just a little term, but I tend to prefer translations that are a little more literal, lead to the literal side, and also leave, leave ambiguity in the text. Uh, in other words, that they're not interpretive. Okay. Uh, I also I also want translations that are more textually up to date. So like in Deuteronomy 32, where it really matters, you got, you know, you've got NRSV, you've got ESV, NLT is up to date there textually, but that's still paraphrastic, not as much as the Living Bible, but it's still in that, you know, you know, sort of bumps right up against that line. But if you just read more than one, it forces you to slow down and read and reread and then think a little bit. Uh, about why the translations, you know, say what they say. And hopefully, again, if you have software or if you have access on the Internet to like the Blue Letter Bible or, you know, some tool that you can penetrate past the English, when you get significant differences, there's very likely a reason why they are as different as they are. If, if you want a free resource, the Net Bible, N-E-T, the Net Bible online is just wonderful. It has tens of thousands of textual notes where the translators explain why they translated it the way they did. Um, so you can you can take advantage of things like this just to slow yourself down and think a little bit. Yeah, I was going to ask you about online resources. I know that's kind of a hairy topic. Uh, I, I get a lot of information sit, sent to me from online resources, yeah. and some of it's pretty scary. But so, so some solid sources out there. You're saying maybe Step, Blue yeah, Letter. The, the, the Net Bible is wonderful. Okay. It, it's available for free. I mean, if they want to buy it in hard copy, they can. If they want to buy it like in software or for Logos by the software, you can. But all the notes, the translation are online. And it's I mean, that's a committee translation of scholars. Um, you know, they, and, and they really took time in the notes to, to explain what they're doing. What about some people who want to go a bit past the English translation but don't have any Hebrew or Greek? Because I have some questions about interlinears, and people are saying, yeah. okay, if I don't know the original language, what can I get and how can I use an interlinear? What, what would you say about that? All right. If, if, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be blunt here. If, if the people who ask that question are actually serious, then they're going to do what I'm, what I'm going to say next. You're going to abandon the use of paper interlinears. Pick them up, throw them away, burn them, okay? They are slow and cumbersome, and they, they just there's very little payoff because it, it would take you days and weeks to do what you can literally do in less than a second if you have software, and you can do it better. Um, so I, I recommend that they get Logos Bible software. Don't don't spend big bucks on a huge base collection or something like that. Just get the lowest collection because what you want is something called the reverse interlinears. Uh, reverse interlinears are you, you can look at an English Bible. There's six or seven of them, major translations. You can right click on an English word and run a search on Greek or Hebrew. You don't even have to know the alphabet. And the reason why that works the way it does is because reverse interlinears are created by hand, a hand process. I've done- By uh, people like you, right? James, yeah. I've done a few others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you mean, it takes a year, it took me a year, two or three hours a day, a solid year to do the King James, but what you're doing is you're linking, hand linking, every word in the translation to the Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic thing from which the translation derives. And the magic of it is now you can concord Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic stuff using English. You don't even have to know the alphabet. It's literally a right click. And then your results of your search, you know that you just searched actually, I searched the Hebrew text, so I don't even know the alphabet, but your results are returned in English. It's like magic. Yes. Yeah, so if you really want to penetrate the English, 
That is the tool to have. It is, it, your question is the reason why we created these things. Yeah, I should probably do a, a demo video later on, just going through Logos and showing that capability, as well as you know how it speeds up research. It is incredible stuff. Yes, I mean, you, you can literally, without even knowing the alphabet, you can do something in, in two or three minutes that a Hebrew scholar would have taken weeks of his life to do. Absolutely. Mike, let's get into commentaries. A lot of them out there and a lot of them not good. So um, <laughs> for, for people who, uh, you know, once again, we're talking about intro to intermediate level, people who don't have any Greek or Hebrew. I don't know, maybe some series, commentary series. How, how would you go about recommending that? Yeah, I, I actually wrote up, I, I wrote some things online. If people want to go to Google and just put in drmsh.com, that's my homepage, drmsh.com, and then put in the word commentaries and then not equal, just write those terms out. You're going to get to a series of, of posts I did on this question, but I'll try to summarize. What you're looking for is your, if you really want substantive discussion, that's going to involve uh, the discussion of, you know, the Bible as literature. It's going to involve, you know, discussing Greek and Hebrew words and all that kind of stuff. What you're looking for, if you if you can't, you know, read Greek or Hebrew is a commentary that uses transliteration. That is, it, it's not going to pepper the page with Hebrew and Greek characters. It's going to use English characters. And you'll at least be able to sound out the words, and the commentator will translate them for you. Any commentary that uses transliteration, where, where the authors are instructed by the publishers to do that, are also instructed to translate the terms because the assumption is that the person who this is created for is not going to be able to just read Greek and Hebrew. So series like that would be the New American uh, Commentary. It's a it's a set, uh, you know, and each volume is, is pretty substantive. You know, uh, the New International Commentary. Both of the, both the NAC and the NIC have all the New Testament sets. Uh, you can buy individual bo uh, volumes, so don't feel like you've got to plump you know, several hundred dollars down for a set. You know, they, they're sold individually as well. The Tyndale commentary set, Old and New Testament, it, they're a little briefer than NAC or NIC, but they're good. You know, they're, they, they've sort of been a mainstay for, for a number of years. The... Um... How's the high definition commentary series coming along? I know a couple of years ago it seems like that they started publishing. Um, do you know anything about that? I, 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 I don't. I don't know what the status of that is. I know they did several volumes. Uh, I don't know if they're going to uh, enlist Steve. Steve Rugby is the guy who does those. Um, I don't know if they're going to enlist Steve to do more or if they're going to have Steve go out there and find somebody to help him. So I, I don't know what the status is. I, my, my, my guess is that they're probably not aiming for a whole set because they haven't produced one for a while. Okay. Uh, well, I like what they guess. did so far. I, I hope they continue. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let, let me ask you uh, about something that Dan Block says with respect to commentaries. He's very careful to say uh, that... He will go through a particular verse in the Bible, he'll diagram it, he'll analyze it, and a commentary is something that comes later on down the line. He doesn't read the text and say, well, that's confusing, and open up a commentary. How, how do you let those two things interface between the study and, and the commentary? When do you reach for, for a commentary? Well, I, I typically start either in a given passage or, um, you know, the given topic. I, I start with, with academic journals. And that's because academic journals can devote more space than a commentary can to any given issue. So I tend to use commentaries when I can't find good journal literature on something. Um, I, I will also, like for the podcast, my, my Naked Bible podcast, when, uh, when we do a book study series, I will, I will pick out 
a couple of commentaries on the book that I, you know, have likely used before and dislike. And so I will read through that. You know, uh, like the, the JPS Torah yeah. uh, commentary series is, is a good one. You know, and, and it's, it's, it's using transliteration and things like that. But I'll read through those and, you know, sort of get the lay of the land. And then that will help me to try to figure out where to drill down on something of, of interest. Um, now, what, what Dan is describing, since Dan is a guy who, who will end up writing commentaries. You know, what he's describing is sort of the nuts and bolts grunt work that will will prepare him yeah. uh, on, a, on a very word by word, even segment by segment, you know, minutia level, you know, to a little prep him. It's prep work for what he's going to write. But for someone just studying, I think it is useful to find a, a, a Tyndale would do this for you uh, again because they're briefer. You can just read through a section pretty quickly, uh, and then maybe go to something that has more detail, like a, a new, an NAC or an NIC. But Expositor's Bible Commentary is another set that, that's good, and then that'll that will you know you'll see you'll get into the weeds a little bit more more detail. So I would I would start from something that's simpler to go through. And then as something either sounds interesting or troublesome or confusing, then you can graduate to something with a little more depth and they'll unpack those things. Yeah, let's let's move from commentaries on the text to commentaries on the context. So, you know, the, the, the vast, fascinating world of the ancient Near East and of uh, the first century, where would you send people who want to learn more about that to get that kind of knowledge that you started us off with from Deuteronomy 32? Yeah. If it's just one book, like a worldview book, I would, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, John Walton's book on uh, an ancient Near Eastern concepts in the biblical world, I think is the title. Um, that's really it's, it's, that's about conceptual worldview. That, that's an excellent book. It really takes you into all sorts of topics. Um, so a one volume, you know, one stop place is, is good. That, that's a good choice. There's really, unfortunately, nothing, nothing really like that on the New Testament side. Um, you're going to be dependent, I think, more on on reference works and fortunately there's a really good free one uh logos produced the lbd lexham bible dictionary um that's quite lengthy it's digital again you have to be in the software world to take advantage of that but it's free <clears throat> you can give me your email address you know you can download the thing and there you're looking for you know you can actually use wall you know, as a sort of a mirror. Well, what about cosmology? You know, what do they think about that in the New Testament? You know, again, you get you, if you get a, a Bible dictionary article, it'll give you Old and New Testament. You know, what about the priesthood? What about sacrifices? What about divination? What about you know the, the supernatural world? What about the afterlife? These are all worldview things that, again, if you can't find them in a single book, again for Old Testament, Walton's you know covered that ground, but you can at least you know, have a good reference set. My, I think the best reference set is the InterVarsity series. Uh, their, their, uh, their handbook series. They've got, I think, let's see, is it three or yeah, it's three volumes for the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's, it's the InterVarsity Dictionary of the Old Testament. There's a Pentateuch volume. There's a Wisdom and Writings volume. There's a Historical Books volume. Well, there's four of them. There's a Prophets volume too. So there's four Old Testament. And then they have four or five New Testament. There's Dictionary of New Testament Backgrounds, Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, Dictionary of Paul and his Letters, Dictionary of the Later New Testament. And then I think I don't know, the fifth one I was thinking of is a different publisher, Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. I think Zondervan does that one. Might be InterVarsity, but, but though, if you had those reference works, you don't need any others except for maybe DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. <clears throat> but there you have 10 reference books. You, you literally just don't need anything else as far as being able to read for worldview kinds of stuff. 
And, and you know, they're, they're, the coverage is bigger than that. You're going to get people, you're going to get places, you're going to get events, you're going to get history. But they're going to have the articles in there for really helping, you know, you wrap your mind around what the liberal writers were thinking about lots of different topics. What do you think about the uh, the illustrated series? Zondervan illustrated Bible yeah, background? I, I like is that, that too. Yeah. I like that too. Yeah, that's available in hard copy. Okay. I would I would put that um, I would still make that a tier two okay. resource. I, the ones I just mentioned would be tier one only because the tier one resources have have wider coverage of topics. Okay. The the Zondervan series is really kind of focused on uh, archaeological stuff, and, and you get a lot of worldview stuff in there, but you won't have you won't necessarily have topical you know, lengthy topical articles on things like chaos. You know, what's the Old Testament concept of chaos? You know, you might get eight pages of that in, in one of the university volumes. You might get two paragraphs in, in the, the Zodderman one because they're trying to illustrate things too. They're going to be more selective um, in what they do. But that that's a good resource. Yeah. So the challenge when getting into these Bible background resources is when do I let it inform my reading of the text? So an example, just for the viewers, you, you come across seraphim in the Old Testament, and then you see, hey, this is similar to something in Egyptian literature. Should I let this yeah. inform my understanding of the Old Testament or not? I mean, when do you apply it? Well, the, the, the biblical right. I mean, I, I, I would say you should, you should predispose to applying it because the biblical writers are part of this world. Part of our problem is the way we're taught about inspiration. It's deeply flawed. Okay. We're taught about inspiration like it's a paranormal event. You know, like the prophet wakes up and he starts making breakfast and then he gets zapped. His mind is disengaged. You know, he has some, you know, he's unconscious or whatever. And then he wakes up and there's a scroll on the table and he's thinking, oh, I can't wait to read what I just wrote there. I think I wrote it. I don't really remember it because, you know, God zapped me and, and you know, God took over my mind and made my arms and my wrists move so that I could, that's absurd. Okay. It's absurd because it, 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 it runs up against dozens, probably hundreds of examples in the text itself where that kind of automatic writing or to use a new age term, the, viewing the Bible as a channeled document just doesn't work. It actually makes the Bible vulnerable to criticism on, on, on many levels. The truth is <clears throat> that, that God providentially prepared everyone who ever touched the biblical text. He prepared every writer. He prepared every editor. And the, and the Bible does have editing in it. There's some very, you know, there's lots of examples, but there's some that are just like, holy cow, I think. Read the first three verses of Ezekiel if you want an editorial example. He switches between the first and the third person several times. If the Holy Spirit's whispering the words into Ezekiel's ear or taking over his brain, that makes no sense at all. Yeah. And just on every page of the Bible, there's something that's going to violate this channel document idea. So since we don't have a channel document, God is responsible for knowing and choosing and molding providentially every person who's going to ever touch this thing, you know, through, through the course of their lives, preparing them for the time and place of his choosing that he will have them write something down for posterity, for the believing community. And, and he lets, he lets those people, it was God's decision to pick people right living in the first millennium or the second millennium BC or the first century AD. These are God's choices. And God doesn't change their minds. He doesn't download advanced knowledge to them that none of their readers would ever understand. Again, it's not a channel document. He picks the people and he lets them do what he wants them to do with the tools and the knowledge at their disposal. And so they're part of this world. And, and it will inform what they're doing just everywhere. And sometimes You'll, you know, it'll, the, the real key here is it'll inform them in different ways. So sometimes the, the writer will write something that reflects sort of a shared worldview kind of idea. Okay, let's take divination, for example. 
Okay, Numbers chapter five, where the woman, you know, suspected of adultery, they grind up some stuff, you know, they have to make her drink it. Oh, you're are you pregnant or not? That's called trial by ordeal. Okay, that's that's the, the term that scholars give to this method of divination. Every ancient culture believed in divination. What's divination? Well, there are methods to get information from the supernatural world, from the world of the gods or the world of God, you know, the, the spiritual world. Okay, everybody believes that. What, so what makes the, the biblical stuff different? Well, the biblical stuff is different because of the beliefs about true and false sources of supernatural information. And God picks certain means by which to communicate with him and to get information. He also includes lots of warnings about what not to do. Uh, again, because if you try to solicit information from supernatural beings, this is not your turf. You can get easily deceived. So you know, buck up and do do it the way I tell you to do it and, and not the way I, I don't. So sometimes it'll, it'll be, you know, shared worldview. Sometimes it'll be a polemic where a biblical writer will borrow an idea or play off is probably a better way to put it, play off of an idea in the ancient world or a, an ancient literary text just to shoot holes in it, just to poke, poke their gods in the eye a little bit. Again, the writers assume that the readers know these, these texts, they know these ideas, they know these figures, these persons, they know that this item of the worldview. And, and, they, and they use it again just to, to fiddle with it, you know, just, just to elevate Yahweh, the God of Israel, and diss some other deity. I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah. And the method of inspiration that you're describing is, seems to me actually to be a superior concept of God that he didn't need to zap somebody. <laughs> he could just, he could just, yeah, I'm going to providentially order your life. And when it's time for John to to hear, write what you see in the apocalypse, then he yep. writes God what he sees. God has prepared him. Yeah, interesting. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another reason why it's better, and it's not better because I can't, I, I didn't invent this, you know, I, it's not an original idea. But I'll, there's another reason why it's better. If if you view it, if you if you go with the paranormal view, the X Files view of inspiration, then God is only interested in the Bible in a few episodes. Mm. You know, during the course of history, if you look at it the other way, God is engaged the entire process, yeah, from start to finish. Again, everyone who will ever touch the text, it it is a you know it it is a a moment by moment providentially guided thing, as opposed to hey, you know, I got five minutes today, I'm going to go zap Isaiah and see the, <laughs> you know what comes out of that. You know? Time for chapter but that's two. The way yeah. we're <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's just absurd, and 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 I can I mean I could sit here and poke fun at it a long time, but I'm actually really concerned about it because what it does is it gives people ideas about scripture that when they go out onto the internet and they read stuff like, hey, you know, did you know the Gospels disagree? And and you probably knew that, but even when they agree, if you actually look at the Greek text, they might even use the same Greek word all three Gospels, but they'll use different tenses. Which one's right? Yeah. You know, in other words, that there there will be people who play off this idea of, of dictation or, or channel document, and they'll say, look, you gotta pick one. You gotta pick one. Because if the Holy Spirit is whispering all this stuff in somebody's ear, either either he's really just playing with your mind, he's yanking your chain, or he can't make up his mind, or they're all wrong. You know, there's just any number of places where you can go in Scripture and, and, and just, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but just destroy people. I mean, uh, again, I, I read a lot of this stuff. So I, I know if, if I were a hostile professor at a college somewhere and, I, and I've got you for Religion 101 because you have to take the course for humanities credit and I just want to destroy your faith, that'll take me about five minutes. Yeah. Because I'm going to use what you've been taught and I'm going to destroy it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was having this conversation recently with with someone. The exact same conversation. We were talking to a uh, another brother who had a, a rather frail view, and and my comment was, I hope he doesn't run into someone who's hostile. You know, it's better yeah. to, better to hear it from a friendly source than a hostile source for sure. But, and in the internet, the, the, the yeah. days of your pastor, the days of your pastor and your parents controlling your access to information are over. Mm -hmm. 
they were long gone. So if, if you're thinking you, know, you can protect people from this kind of thing, even if they don't go to you know university or whatever, you're just mistaken. You got podcasts, you got talk shows, you got websites. They are going to have their faith assaulted in some way. Well, that's that's part of uh, you know the appreciation that we have for your work, and you mentioned Walton as well. Um, there aren't many scholars who will bridge the gap between non-specialists and specialists, and uh, so we're we're glad for your work and uh, others that's out there online as well, Craig Evans and others who are providing yeah. really solid information because it it is an issue, you know, uh, for sure. Yeah, for, for my podcast, I mean, I look for people like this. I want to see, and the ones you mentioned are, are certainly, you know, right on target. I mean, but there are a few scholars now that are doing things, and here's the key word, intentionally, to have their content, you know, trickle down to the pew. And I think that's going to change. Uh, I think the younger generation that's used to, social media and podcasting and whatnot. I mean, they're, they're, if you're going to be a professor, they're still built in traps. The publisher parish thing is real. But I, I think even despite that, people in, in the upcoming generation are just going to be more intentional here. At least, at least that's my hope. I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of that plays into personal Bible study. I mean, honestly, I get some questions that, that, that I feel like, uh, you know, respectfully that people should know. And so that's, you know, part of the, the motivation for this and exposing people to resources and, and that type of thing to deepen their own knowledge. That, that's, that's where, you know, that's where your confidence should lie is in your, you know, in the text itself and not in what somebody says about it. And that seems to be, to be another problem with, uh, you know, the current age of information. But Mike, can we do some, uh, some audience Q&A questions? We'll, uh, sure. we'll fit as many of these in as we can uh, in our remaining time. Uh, the first one, this is a big question. What are the Targums and why are they important? The Targums, <clears throat> the word Targum refers to an Aramaic translation. So if your Old Testament Targums are Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. You have New Testament Targums that would be Aramaic translations of the Greek New Testament. Okay, but typically when people talk about the Targums, it's with the Old with the Old Testament in mind. The reason why they're important is because <clears throat> if you remember like the book of Ezra, you know, when they when they came back from exile, Ezra had to read the scripture for them and then give them the sense thereof. It's, it's the, actually the word for translate. So even back in Old Testament times, the average, <clears throat> the average Jew was losing the ability to read Hebrew and to converse in Hebrew. Eventually, Aramaic became the language of, of Judea, you know, like Jesus' native language would have been uh, Aramaic. So it was really important to have their Bible translated into Aramaic. And there are features of the Targums that are real interesting theologically. For example, a great book. I mean, I spent a lot of my time on... on uh, arguing that the idea of a Godhead, you know, God in more than one person, but yet the same, is an Old Testament idea. And, uh, you know, that, that you can get that from your Old Testament text. You don't even need to go to your New Testament to get that. One of the, the indications that is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is, is sometimes referred to as Yahweh himself. And in Jeremiah 1, for instance, there's even a, it's anthropomorphized. The word of the Lord reached out his hand, you know, and touched my mouth, you know. So you've got the word, you've got as a man, you know, but he's called the word of the Lord. Well, the Targums do something really interesting with that. They insert the word memron, which is the Aramaic word for word, in various places in the Old Testament to anthropomorphize God when God is already in the scene. So you actually get, you know, God as man, as the word, in, through the Targum translations. And, and it may not even be reflected in the Hebrew. Conceptually, it might work. And so that's why they did it. <clears throat> you know, like Genesis 19.24, God rained sulfurous fire, you know, from heaven, you know, you know or how does it go? 
Yeah, the Lord reigns sulfur is fun. Let me let me just look it up real quick. But this is this is kind of a classic instance. The, the Lord rained down fire from the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord rained down fire from the Lord. Yeah, you have the Lord there twice in the same verse. Yeah. Well, the Aramaic Targum takes one of them and makes it the Memra. Yeah. The word of the Lord did this, and the Lord did the other. So if you grow up in Judea. Okay, you're used to this kind of language if you're reading your Bible or you're hearing your Bible in Aramaic. You're familiar with the idea of the word of the Lord yeah. is, a, is a man, an anthropomorphized figure. There you go. I mean, that, John, John is inventing this idea in John chapter 1. There's a whole book on this, by the way, by a guy named John Ronning, yes. R-O-N-N-I-N-G. Yes, excellent. <laughs> and he goes to the Aramaic Targums and with an eye toward looking through the Gospel of John, John's writings. And, and it's just fascinating stuff. Yeah. So why is that important? Because the next time you hear Bart Ehrman or somebody else say that, that the, the Trinity or the deity of Christ was a late invention of church councils or centuries after the New Testament, you know, just, you know, say, what gives? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know why, aren't, why aren't you looking not only in the Old Testament, but looking back at the Targums? That it's, it's a bogus claim. And I think we both know why people like that aren't looking. But um, <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. What is your? Um, do you use biblical commentaries from the early church fathers, and um, how do you view uh, the early church fathers' consensus on various theology? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't use. I, I'm wondering if they're talking about the InterVarsity series, the Ancient Christian Commentary series. That would be my guess. Um, the ACCT. Yeah, yeah, I, I have used that a, a, on a couple of occasions. I don't use it intentionally. Um, on, on the one hand, I'm going to say two things here. On the one hand, I don't really care what the church fathers said because they are a post-biblical con context. I'm interested in the context of the writers, not the context of guys living centuries later, especially in the Old Testament where none of them could read Hebrew. You can literally count on one hand the number of church fathers who could read Hebrew. There's origin. Uh, Jerome certainly. I think Tertullian, you know, might have been able to, but it's it's very small. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Augustine most of them, didn't either. The did one he? big ones are Latinists. Yeah. Origin. Yeah. 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 Kind of. Um, so on the one hand, I'm not looking for them to tell me the meaning of the text, because what, a lot of what the church fathers are doing, they they're they're contextually removed by a few centuries, even a millennia. A millennium, you know, uh, you know, they're they're just they're not able to tap into the into the context, and they're also writing to respond to issues of their own day, which is important. You know, they're they're doing exegesis with an eye toward answering questions that their own you know people had that they had you know, entering into the, the important theological discussions of the day. So, so there's some of that going on too. However, having said that. I actually think that the church fathers for, for the, the coming, the current and coming generation of the believing church are going to be really important because we are progressively moving back to the pagan past. And, and we're going to be we're going to be really smart if we observe how the church fathers debated pagans and pagan ideas like monism uh, in their own day, because they have been there and done that. And, and we're you know we're going to be repeating their efforts after them. So I I think they're really they're really useful for certain things to help us think theologically. And, and philosophical theology is not a swear word, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. But but I don't I don't look to them to do biblical exegesis. You know, let, let's face it. If, if we're talking about interpreting the Bible in, in context, all this ancient Near Eastern material, stuff like the Dead Sea Scrolls, stuff like you know Second Temple Jewish literature. The church fathers didn't have access to any of this. I mean, we didn't have access to it until the 19th century. Right, yeah. Because it wasn't discovered or translated. You know, the, the, those are impediments. And it's not like I'm saying, well, you know, you all thought the gospel was A and Mike says it's B because of all the stage you're doing. No, that, that, that's, that's ridiculous. There's a lot of scripture that, that, that anybody can read at any time and, and understand. But, but the depth of it, the interconnectedness of it, all sorts of strange passages, so even some really big, important concepts, you will not understand correctly without that stuff. You just won't. Um, 
and then that's why it's our responsibility today to you know to do that work i i, I don't think luther or calvin should have done it there's no way they could have done it if if they would have had the material they would do better with it than i can because they're they're just they were brilliant mm-hmm. but they just didn't have it yeah and a lot of that ties back into the translations that you mentioned earlier i mean scholars have thankfully for us, gone through, you know, one million plus cuneiform tablets and thousands of Greek manuscripts and have given us better, um, better translations as a result of all this. Data. Better so, than me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but come on. I, I'm glad you did it, but you, I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to. You, you're the, your work, you're yeah. the ancient Near Eastern guy. I thought you would like that. It, it doesn't sound like fun, huh? Oh, no, no, not, not, uh, let's go through, you know, a hundred a hundred thousand, you know, receipts, you know, quite tablet <laughs> receipts. That, sorry, I don't want to be an accountant. So, so that you can find a couple of lines of uh, biblical manuscripts. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, there you go. So I look back at my, uh, back when my Bible studies took off, um, and, and that was basically when I realized, hey, the Bible's a lot more complicated than I thought. If someone from your perspective, you said you started studying the Bible as a teenager, right? Yeah. So... So if you could go back to five years ago when you were a teenager, um, <laughs> what would you tell yourself? What, what would be a good path to set yourself on a, on a good course for Bible studies? Any, any sort of big course corrections that you would make? Do I, do I have the tools I had then or do I have the tools I have that are aware of? You, you have the tools right now. You're, you're a viewer mm-hmm. who's just wanting to get started and they're saying, how do I take off? <laughs> I, I, would say, I would say there's great benefit to just reading through Scripture two or three or four times. Uh, and, and then after you've done that, then you need to start to drill down. So there is great benefit, again, to having software to penetrate the English translation quickly, and then good lexicons that can you know, give you word level information and, and the, the better discussion lexicons. I'm thinking of things like the New International Dictionary of Old Testament theology and, and New Testament theology. They will have conceptual discussions in them. So uh, I, I definitely would recommend that would be the next level, you know, penetrating the, the translation to do word level stuff. And then you're, you're going to be exploring more things beyond that. But in this day and age, we have things digitally like the Faith Life Study Bible. OK, um, it's two or three million words. It, it's a lot bigger than a normal study Bible. And it has drill downs into all sorts of resources. Again, there's a reason why we created this thing where I work. It's exactly this, it, and it, it's free. You know, some of the, the, the things you'll link out to are free. You'd have to you'd have to buy different books or what, but you get, you get two or three million words. And then a lot of it, since I can say this, since I wrote the notes from Genesis through Judges, you know, are, are going to have a, a lot of this worldview stuff in it. I mean, we we were intentional about that. So you need to start getting into you know being able to penetrate your English translation. You need to start, you know, using tools that can get you to cross references quickly. Speed is a big issue here. Yeah. And then, you know, branching out into things that will, will start to guide you to thinking about topically, again, the, these conceptual topics of, of the Bible. Again, going back to the ancient understanding of a given topic, not the modern one. How, how long did you spend studying the Bible before you actually started learning biblical languages? I, I took my first Greek class in, it was 84. So I would have been a believer about six years. And did you find that sort of uh, really kick-started your studies? Or? Oh, I, I, I loved it. You know, yeah. I was... I was good at, at languages. I mean, I had a good short, short-term short memory. That's, that's pretty important for getting grades in languages. You know, long-term memory is a little bit better. But again, we didn't have, we didn't have like Quizlet, you know, online, you know, with right. yeah. just make your own, your flashcard. I mean, we didn't have all these digital tools. But yeah, it, it, it was exciting. I mean, I, I did hit a wall, you know, uh, at, at some point uh, because, you know, you... You you discover at some point when you're doing languages, and again, this is I don't want this to sound bad, because your language study can go one of two directions. Either you're learning how you're, you're learning the value of the language for exegesis. You know, in other words, you 
you're learning it for interpreted payoff, or you're just learning to reproduce an English translation that you already have. So you should not be learning languages just to produce a translation, because you already got those. Right. You should be learning languages for interpreted payoff. And then once you have a certain facility with languages, then it's time to get into serious commentaries who will talk about you know, how the grammar or some other some feature of the language affects how you're understanding a passage. Yeah, the, the word commentary series is excellent for that. I really like yeah. um, Stuart Douglas' work. It's, it's incredible. The, 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 Baker, the Baker series, um, yeah, Baker, I'm trying to remember what it is, Greek textual comments, something like that. Yeah. Baker exegetical. Those are really good, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at some point, you know, if you're used to, if, if you get exposed, like if you're in college or seminary, you get exposed to journal literature, you're going to you're gonna find writers that are, are really better at this than some others. And then you begin to look at, okay, has this guy written a commentary in whatever series? Yeah. You know, and you'll, you'll start to, you know, kind of follow, you know, different scholars because you just, they're just good at it. So there, there, there's, at some point that becomes a factor as well. So we're winding down on time. For those who may be absolutely bewildered, um, <laughs> to, to use a, a term that goes back to uh, Babel, um, if you could pick a book from the Old Testament and the New Testament and a commentary. So, so someone wants to get started in the New Testament or Old Testament, how about giving us a book and a commentary, you know, kind of a start here? What would you say? Yeah. Well, it's hard not to pick Genesis. Good grief. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think here. Something maybe a little more manageable. Um, you know, well, I'll, I'll go with Deuteronomy. Okay. Um, you know, I, I love T. Gay's JPS yes. Torah commentary on Deuteronomy. Now the problem is, is T. Gay is a, is a critical scholar, so he's going to be, you know, doing the JEDP thing, you know, right. here and there. But the the thing has like thirty excursions. It's excellent. Yeah, <laughs> it's just awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I would I would recommend Deuteronomy, and then that you know T. Gay's JPS commentary, mm -hmm. and on the New Testament, I really like uh, I like. R.T. France. Yes, Matthew. For uh, Matthew, yes. yes. I mean, France is just good. Yes. He, he's just a really good commentator. And he's really well-versed in the Old Testament as well, so he gives yes. you a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I really liked, liked his work. All right, Mike, final question. Got to get, gotta get this one in. Your favorite Bible verse, please. Favorite Bible verse. <laughs> You know, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? <laughs> that he should defy the armies of the living God. I, I, I just love that David statement, but I, I'm not going to count that. Oh, boy. Let me think here. I, I like uh, Jeremiah 32, 27. Uh, you know, behold, I am the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Hmm. So I, I'll go with that one. But I, I love the who is this uncircumcised Philistine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have one for one for theological value and one for humor. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple of those for sure. Mike, um, I want to let you get back to your car that's uh, disabled in the snow. Uh, thanks, thanks <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Really appreciate it. And I'll direct everyone to uh, check out your excellent work. And uh, thank you for all that you do. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, bye bye.